pat ourselves, pat ourselves on the back. But uh, an unintended consequence was a growth of uh, opioids uh, and heroin. Uh, with something, I don't want to say we're caught off guard on, but we thought by shutting down the pill mills, we solved the problem. And it's only gotten worse ever since. And so now we continue to look for policy solutions, uh, somewhat piecemeal, of how are we going to stop this trend or move it in a different direction. Uh, I worked when I was at the State House and got passed the naloxone legislation. It's my understanding, given the speakers you've had, maybe you've heard about naloxone. Some have heard, anyone not sure what naloxone is? It's okay not to know what naloxone is. I didn't know what it was when the constituent came to me and asked for it. So naloxone is a nasal spray that if someone is having a heroin overdose, will stop that overdose. Uh, they absolutely still need to get medical treatment. They're still gonna have withdrawal symptoms uh, from that overdose, but it will save their life. And so we worked on legislation to make naloxone more accessible. At the time, in 2012, uh, there were two pilot programs in Portsmouth, Cuyahoga and Scioto County, and in Cleveland and Cuyahoga County for Project Don uh, getting naloxone out there. We needed to spread that to the other 86 counties. We have eight counties in the state of Ohio. Uh, so that was a small piece, but it was just a piece to the bigger puzzle of other policy solutions that we could be working on. Uh, now naloxone is readily out there. Uh, all of our paramedics have it on them, our firefighters, when they do calls, uh, will always, you know, when you talk to them, naloxone is one of the biggest things that they use uh, when they come upon a people showing heroin symptoms to save their life, get them to uh, medical treatment, uh, emergency work. And so, you know, we're going in the wrong direction in terms of our growth of the problem. Uh, we'll continue to study, continue to look for policies. The challenge is if there was one easy policy, we would pursue it. Uh, there's so many different components, so many different ways in which to address the issue. I had colleagues pass legislation uh, to increase the penalty uh, for people that were distributing, uh, that were uh, selling uh, different drugs. Whether or not that solves it continues to be a chicken and mouse or a cat and mouse game of, you know, where's the real problem? Who should we be uh, focusing on and how do we get the best help? At the local level, uh, at the city hall, uh, really what I've seen us respond most with, not only through our Department of Health and trying to get naloxone out there and other resources, but making sure we have enough treatment, uh, beds, centers in place. Uh, so we last year allocated funds to work with Alvis to create a treatment facility on Livingston Avenue. Uh, that was the community that had the biggest need that didn't have uh, resources readily available. Some people didn't like that, they thought we were putting um, a problem in their backyard, uh, but able to justify it, we just could have communicated it a little bit better. And so that's the challenge, is we know we have a problem, we know we have a trend going in the wrong direction. What policies can we put in place that either absolutely solve uh, the problem, I don't think there is a necessarily policy in place, or what incremental steps can we do to better address it, get people treatment, get them help, and hopefully get uh, our number as being one of the worst of the worst states uh, get in a better direction. So that's me talking a lot. What questions do you all have? Fourth speaker, you got to have lots of questions. I'm the only policymaker you met with, so got to have lots of questions. You're in the hot seat. So what are some policies that have been made? So I mentioned the locks of, uh, another policy that we worked on that was meant to address the epidemic was a needle exchange. Everyone familiar with what a needle exchange is? It pretty much uh, allows for, uh, well it does, uh, allowing the distribution of clean needles. So particularly with heroin, uh, when people are using dirty needles, there are additional medical consequences, be it hepatitis, be it HIV. And so if we can put in place uh, a needle exchange, so getting them clean needles, uh, that will reduce those trickle-down health consequences. We know people are going to use. We know what they use to use. So is a clean needle a way in which we can help an additional cost that the state would have to incur uh, and cities would have to incur? Or is it the other kind of selling point for needle exchanges? It creates another touch point. It allows for people to engage, go to a center, and maybe that's where they get the information of finally trying to want to get clean. Um, so that's a big piece. Uh, continuing to provide funding for additional treatment, for additional beds, uh, has been a big priority. And then Governor Kasich had the Let's Talk initiative, which was focused on going to high schools and using peer-to-peer -peer discussions of drug use, trying to keep uh, 
young people from using, using drugs and creating additional problems. The big challenge that I always saw, and I don't know um, the mother of the addict, uh, how uh, her daughter got involved uh, with drug use was, it was a lot of people having sports injuries, getting pain uh, pills, and then continuing that cycle of, okay, so you're shutting down the pain pills, so I'm not going to get overprescribed, but now where do I go to get that high or be able to reduce that pain? And so uh, trying to find that route and being able to address that appropriately because we aren't necessarily going to shut down uh, the need for pain pills uh, because everyone uses it. The example I share is my 88-year-old grandmother had back issues. They pretty much got hooked on pain pills and they had to wean her off. If she was in her 20s in Portsmouth, Ohio, where my grandparents live, would she have pursued other avenues? Would have been heroin, would have been additional pills if she had been at that age or age. At 88, not quite as mobile, uh, but they had to find ways to wean her off because that was the only way she felt good was getting her the pills. So I've seen it personally. Yes, ma'am. What's you your say, name? Sydney. When, when you say um, you're going to, like, you mean you're going to give the people who are distributing it to the addicts more time in jail? So colleagues did do that. So they increased the felony felony so that if you were being, uh, and it was for dealers, uh, prosecuted, then the penalty was going to be a greater threshold. Historically, that's what the legislature does. Whatever the, hot, the drug is, so be cocaine. Um, than heroin, uh, you could look through history. We just continue to increase the felony felony, so it adds, but it's always supposed to be directed at the dealers, um, more time. Uh, another piece of legislation that we worked on, wasn't quite the way I think it was intended, was if you were someplace and someone was having an overdose, uh, giving them immunity that if they called the police and stayed with the person, they wouldn't be charged. Uh, what we consistently heard from parents in particular was, my child was left alone was with people that were supposed to be their friends, overdosed, and they just left them there to die. Maybe they called the cops and they left, but if you would stay. So um, that was legislation we worked on with the intent that by having people, you know, there's a willingness. The police want to get people the help they need, um, but there's always that we're afraid we're gonna be in trouble for having done something illegal as well. And so creating uh, immunity laws that would allow them to do that. And so we progressed that as well. Um, but the penalty one's always the issue, because when you hear there's more penalties, are you really going to call and you don't know what you're going to be prosecuted? It's a judgment call from the county prosecutor's office. Good, good laws? Do you think those are all going in the right direction? Do you have other ideas? I've been thinking about this for almost two hours now. Yes, sir. Is there a limit to how far you can go with the policy? The Constitution, yeah. I mean, at some point, <coughs> we may overstep. Um, Somewhat the legislative mindset, it's legal until the judge says it's not. Uh, and depending on what judge you have, they may interpret it that we have violated that due process or we violated something else. But we could pretty much pass whatever we want. Um, you know, they do that with other legislation, not just trying to address this. Uh, you, know, you always hear that's unconstitutional. It is, it's legal until uh, it's challenged in court and either gets uh, stopped or delayed. Other thoughts, questions? It's much more fun, yes, when you um, guys ask questions. Have like you guys thought about like looking at the dealers <coughs> to like kind of like get their point to you? I don't know. So shockingly, dealers aren't coming down to the state house yeah. uh, saying, "Hey, I regulators." I think, though, that's an important discussion to have. Yeah. Um, that's where it's coming from. I think we know it's coming out of Mexico. Uh, primarily starting in southern Ohio in just the state's uh, geographical location between New York and Chicago, also along uh, the corridor that passes through Toledo. Um, we are awkwardly positioned and you know, when a small drug cartel can come into southern Ohio, there's not a lot of gang activity, there's not a lot of turf wars, they can just go infiltrate, maybe not make a huge profit, but establish their ground. That's what's happening. Um, so they're going after them. I wouldn't say there's a lot of discussions just because it's they're not going to engage and say, hey, shut us down, shut down our black market. Uh, some people always encourage, well, make it legal. Take away the black market. Tax it, so good for everyone, um, and see how that goes. Some countries have kind of pursued that. I don't think you'll ever see that in Ohio. But it's, I mean, that's part of who do you find, how do you discuss the issues. You know, talking to addicts, 
and learning kind of how they got to the point that they got to, um, where they felt they had nowhere else to turn, how it was available, what other policies were in place. That's an important role of the policymaker. Uh, you all play an important role in the policymaking process. If there's legislation that you support, you'd like to see, and that yeah, you have, that's how the process begins, is you reaching out to your elected officials. So everyone knows who their state rep is and state senator? Exactly. Uh, or their city council members? Um, my wife didn't know who her state rep was, except he lived in the same house, so I get it. Um, but that's a huge piece when you're thinking of policies or what can the city or state be doing better, a level of your engagement. 90% of the bills I had passed uh, began with legend, or a call from a constituent or an email um, and working through the process and helping them navigate you, because that's who we're there to be the voice of, uh, to what policies you'd like to see in place. So have you had any ideas of policies now that you're on your fourth speaker? Yes, sir. Um, one of the ladies, I think the one whose son uh, was a drug addict. She was talking about how the teachers and everybody there, they're not equipped yeah. to handle drug addicts. So, what if you guys made it a policy to where to be a teacher, you need some sort of education in that area? That's not a bad idea. The challenge will be we already require teachers to have so many certificate, <laughs> certificate qualifications. What would adding an hour or two hours on top of what you already need, or what would you take away? That becomes the balance. It's a great idea. Um, and some people would say, you know, have more nurses or have a nurse's aide. Maybe they're the ones better equipped to address it. You know, let history, government, math teachers focus just on that area. But that's always the balance uh, in terms of how we uh, require the certification for teaching and for other professions. Um, like I know it's not that common in this school. I don't know if anybody's on here in the school, but they should have like drug counselors, even though we have a counselor in the school specifically for this. So part of it is, you know, I'm going to call it a safe space. But would you feel comfortable going to that counselor or not? I don't know what that would look like these days. Uh, when I was in high school, there were some teachers I was comfortable going with with anything. Other ones I wouldn't talk to at all. And part of that's that approach. It costs money. Uh, school budgets are already pretty tight, and so would we allocate for that, or are there other uh, priorities that, again, uh, maybe uh, when I was at State House, a lot of school superintendents, school boards were very frustrated. The legislature was mandating additional requirements without providing funding, so an unfunded mandate. Um, good idea. I would contact your legislator and say, hey, what do you think about this idea? How could we make it happen? Could we set up a pilot program in the school district that's willing to do it? Um, it's very tough uh, because they do feel, particularly state superintendents, we keep piling on unfunded mandates and not giving them um, the money. I, if you gave them the money, I think they would do it. Uh, if it's just a mandate without the funding, they're stretched already. And where, what would they cut in order to accomplish that goal? But we do it all the time at the state house. Anyone from this side of the room? I'm just tired of speakers, right? Or is a lot of speakers? Anything else? How are we on time? We got a lot of time still, right? Yeah, so you guys got to ask plenty of questions. Lots. You can ask them anything. <laughs> if you're tired of talking about it, we can talk about other issues. It's the same question you asked the last person? No, what's the last name? Stinzion. S T I N Z I A N O. My cell number is 614-219-9224. It's the longest name on the ballot. I also have Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat. You just got to figure out how to spell Stinziana. <laughs> lots of vowels. Lots of vowels. Yes, sir. How do you find pills? How do you find doctors who are doing So that was the original challenge. Um, they would be able to, so the person was abusing or breaking into stores. Um, they were able to kind of track it back and find the three, four, six doctors in that community that were overprescribing. And so that was, you know, AG, Attorney General's office was involved, the Board of Pharmacy was involved. So it was just kind of doing investigations, 
then sending people in undercover saying, oh, my knee hurts, can you give me pills? I mean, they would just write prescriptions without looking at people because they were getting the additional uh, medical insurance coverage on it. Uh, so they were making money. So, so it was really just an undercover investigation, uh, figured it out. We increased the penalties that if you were going to be a pill mill, you would lose your license. That pretty much shut it down. They didn't go to jail. Um, the worst offender, I believe, committed suicide. All charges were pending. Okay. It was bad. Yes, ma'am. How long does it take to pass policy? Just depends. Um, I mentioned my father was a legislator, right? Uh, it took him one time 18 years to get a piece done, and I came on and I worked on it, so about four decades uh, to pass getting student trustees on uh, school boards. Other times, it can pass within a month. Uh, it just depends the timing, the political will, the education. The Naloxone we got done within two years. Um, U sports concussions I got done within two years. Other pieces have been around decades. And so it really just depends the history, the knowledge of the legislature. Tougher now because of term limits, so you get a new wave of new folks just by uh, natural matriculation. Um, and so they all have to get re-educated on the issue. Maybe they like it, maybe they don't. But it really just depends uh, when we have one thing that's been kicked around is declaring our opioid crisis and state emergency. Uh, would that uh, help draw additional awareness? Could we do it at the city level? But are we going to follow it with funding for what's going to be the policies in place? Yes, sir? Why not create a program that would encourage schools to support student organizations that would oppose the opioid epidemic and then secure funding to give those groups a little more reach so that they can actually make something happen. So does that need to be a law? Couldn't school boards do that? Or <coughs> Metro already do that? I think you could do it with existing laws. But I, what I'm thinking of is more of community involvement. I think that's a great idea. And I think talking to your city council or your state rep, you know who your state rep is? Ah, not particularly. Where do you live? Um, I actually have no idea. You have no idea where you live. It's two for two with me on that. <laughs> so you're in Franklin County, and then the next answer was somewhere in the planet. And uh, what I was going to mention too was that there are a lot of great solutions in the world. I think you know, there are a lot of great organizations, but they don't always have to reach and actualize those. So that's a huge point. And you know, Project Don, who are the pilot programs in Soda County and Cuyahoga County, for example, were doing great work. But then how to amplify them? And it was really just building that network of getting in contact with the right person. So they started with Terry Johnson, who was the state rep in Southern Ohio. Terry Johnson took to the speaker at the time, Bill Batchelor. Bill Batchelor took to the governor. And that's how it grew. So I mean, policy, that's part of what you look to your elected officials, is help navigate you through that process, how to make that additional reach. Uh, people are doing wonderful things. For whatever reason, maybe they don't want to contact or don't know how to contact. A council member, hopefully, now that you have my last name and cell phone number, you don't have that hesitation. Um, but that's always the challenge is if they're doing good stuff, uh, how do we get them additional funds? What that funding would go to and really amplify their work? Uh, we clearly don't want to continue going in the direction as a state, as a county, as a city, as we've been, which is a downward trend that gets worse and worse and worse. Um, we are always open to ideas that are going to, you know, not just be an advantage on the wound but really start solving and dealing with the problem. Yes, ma'am. So as, because it can potentially take so long to pass the policy, have you ever felt like it wasn't worth it, worth the effort that you put in because it keeps getting worse and you keep passing these policies? So when I served in the state house, I was in the legislative minority. So I'm a Democrat, and Republicans had a majority. They now have a super majority. And so just given the way politics are, my idea was never going to be implemented just the way I wanted. Other people were going to chime in and touch it. And so I always commented it was half a loaf, but that's better than no loaf at all. Um, so that was the legislative frustration. Now, I don't think that's exclusive to being the minority, but it was almost a given that if I wanted to get a bill passed, I needed a Republican to work with, and that Republican was going to be the lead. Um, that meant my name, even though it was a constituent who had the idea, would become second level. Um, but that was okay. I mean, you got to put personal ego, frustrations aside for the greater good. When you're at the state house, you are there working on policy, not only for your 116,000 constituents in your district, but also the 11.2 million Ohioans uh, that all the policies change. At the city level, um, seven members representing 850,000 people 
Um, there's always going to be frustration. Policy should not be necessarily quick. Uh, you want it to be well thought out, uh, well debated, well vetted. Uh, so it is the best piece of policy for the greater good. Uh, and that just, depending on where the potential is, depending on the day, the hour, that can look very different. Question over here? I was going to ask what it's like working in government. It's fun. Uh, it just depends on the <coughs> issue. It can often be frustrating sometimes. Uh, I'm currently having a very frustrating battle with a department at the city where uh, a community wants to keep a traffic signal. I think there's no reason not to keep said traffic signal, uh, and they just don't want to do it. And so you know, I'm not trying to uh, call anyone out, but I just don't understand why we just can't keep a traffic signal. Um, if you watch the TV show Parks and Rec, city government yeah, can be very yeah. much like that. Um, everyone's got a garbage can, everyone has a pothole. Um, and that's what's exciting, that's what I like about my job. I just don't feel enough people engage us. Uh, because we have our 311 system at the city, that's where they tell people, call 311, call 311. So they're getting hundreds of calls a day. My phone barely rings. Uh, I give out my cell phone number, nobody calls it. Um, and so, <laughs> it might just be me, right? Um, but that's part of the frustration. But at the end of the day, absolutely can help people absolutely can improve lives, and that's what's the benefit. That's what I enjoy about it. Uh, but it's not meant to be a fast process. Um, if something moves quickly, you should be very suspicious of what is really the intention or what's going on. Um, but it also doesn't always have to move as slow as it does. Yes? Um, do the councilmen actually go out to the community where it's affecting and like, where it's really, like, I don't know. So, depends how you want to view what going out looks like. So I hold weekly community hours. I'll be at a library, a coffee shop, um, where, where was I? Um, a church basement where they're serving meals every week. Um, drives my wife crazy, but I'll do two Saturdays every month, uh, two weekdays uh, out of a month. And I don't come with an agenda. I'm there for an hour and a half to meet with people, talk to them. Um, and it's frustrating that I don't have more people that come. Um, but I try and do everything I can not to be at City Hall. My staff likes that, and I like that, because um, that's where you get ideas. That's where you get to understand what people's frustrations are. Uh, they're a little more open. Parking at City Hall stinks as well, and people get intimidated when come into this big government building. Um, so I try and go out, again, library, coffee shop, someplace that's not quite as intimidating. So I know my style. I think my colleagues are very open to being out and about. Um, the element that's always tough is be invited or insert ourselves. So I was invited to be here today and very appreciative of that opportunity. If I had just shown up and said, oh, I want to speak, different kind of reception, different kind of vibe. And so that's always kind of the balance of how to inject, get involved. Last night, I spoke at the Greater Hilltop Area Commission, um, was invited to, they gave me 30 minutes. I probably could have gone to their meeting, they could have asked me, oh, do you have anything to say? I wasn't on their agenda the other times I stopped it. And so I always am trying to be very sensitive to people's time and also kind of the context of the environment I've been invited into. But I would say for the most part, yeah, there's no place I won't go. Um, it, it makes for some interesting dynamics, but um, the best place to get ideas is sitting in someone's living room uh, where they don't feel like they have to put on a big show, but really will tell you what's going on, where the frustration is. Yeah. So our time's up. And thank you, guys. So let's give a round of applause. And uh, for those of you.